Hi, and welcome to What's Up Williston. I'm your host, Eric Wells. We're, we're back here for our September episode, and joining me this month is Planning Director Matt Belanger. We're going to be talking about housing this month. Um, the town's been doing a lot of work looking at our housing bylaws and have a public hearing come up, coming up on some transmitted um, amendments from the Planning Commission to the Select Board. So we're going to jump into it in just a minute, but the uh, logistics here, the public hearing on these proposed amendments is going to be on Tuesday, October 17th at 7.30 p.m. in Town Hall. These are really focused on um, um, housing supportive amendments, uh, including inclusionary zoning. So I thought um, with Matt here today, we can kind of get into this proposal a little bit more and talk about housing. Kind of to start, the town did a housing needs assessment earlier this year, and that really confirmed um, what we felt um, that there was um, a number of areas for the town to explore further in housing. Um, is that kind of on track there, Matt? Yeah, so, um Coming out of a bunch of our rezoning work in the Taft Corners area, we identified a need to do more around the encouragement of the creation of affordable housing. Um, and with all of the opportunity in our new zoning to create um, you know, more homes in Williston, we did want to look at what the need was and make sure that any changes to the zoning that would encourage housing uh, met those needs or, or fed into what those needs were. So. We did have a housing needs assessment done. That um, report is available on our website to go take a look at. And in a general sense, it confirmed some things that we'd already been perceiving out in the community. Um, there's generally very low ability, low availability of homes in Williston, um, resulting in higher prices than usual. And in particular, um, very, very low availability of homes that might be considered affordable, particularly for the workforce that we see coming into Williston every day um, to work the jobs that are available there. Mm. So once we had that data, the Planning Commission got to work last spring. We had a, multiple discussions with the select board to kind of unpack what that meant and think of some pathways for the town to consider moving forward. And from that work through the spring and summer, we have some, these transmitted bylaw amendments that are going to be considered um, coming up this fall. So uh, I was thinking to start, um, if you could share with the viewers, kind of what's the overall theme of these amendments? What, what are they looking, um, what the proposals look like here? Sure. So the theme of the amendments is to take what exists in the current zoning bylaws, which is an incentive to create affordable homes as a part of new residential projects, and really elevate it to the point where it's its own pathway to approval beyond the way Williston currently approves residential projects. Um, Williston's really unique in Vermont in that we have a middle step in our residential approval process called growth management, where we schedule out um, a limited number of new dwelling units that are created over a given period of time in town. And that schedule is by its nature limited and therefore getting on the schedule is competitive. Mm. So under the current system, providing affordable homes as a component of a project is one of many incentivized attributes of a project. Others might be trails or open space or um, neighborhood design, things like that, energy efficiency. So what the proposed amendments do is they set a, um, a metric by which a project that provides enough of certain kinds of affordable homes would follow an approval path outside of that growth management schedule. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would need to meet uh, some pretty stringent commitments around the, the number and type of affordable homes. And those homes would need to be affordable in perpetuity via legal restriction but those projects would not compete as part of that growth management schedule and their, their units would not be part of that limited number of units on the schedule. So a question we've received is, okay, if you're gonna remove these projects from growth management, growth management has allocations that each year, we try to plan for the number of new units, new population each year. How's that gonna Im impact the overall um, growth of the town? We think with, with the levels that are set in the draft bylaw amendment, Mostly, it's going to shift the proportion of projects that follow the affordable path out of the projects that would have otherwise followed the growth management path. In other words, fundamentally, we don't expect to see a whole lot more units per year created under these changes. We expect the projects that include affordable homes to increase and the projects that follow the growth management path to decrease. And I can talk a little bit about why we think that's going to happen um, when we get into the details of the revision. Sure. And I want to share, too, the town has a wastewater allocation ordinance that really kind of serves as our 
our check and balance here for development. Mm -hmm. That that wastewater capacity has to be allocated each year. So there's only so much to sell for each um, each type of development. That's right. You know most. Almost all new dwellings that are created in Williston need to purchase wastewater treatment capacity from that limited pool, which is um, connected to, but but another um, pathway to a, another piece of the path to approval that all residential projects have to follow. So there's a limit there that exists regardless of how we handle this other part of the process. Okay. So kind of getting to the more nuts and bolts here, but first, um, you know. We hear this a lot, affordable housing, and sometimes I feel like that, that's a misnomer, shouldn't all housing be affordable? But you know, we get into it from a, a public policy realm. What are, we, what are we talking about with affordable housing? Sure. So the first part is um, what affordable means is that a household can meet their housing expenses spending no more than 30% of their income in doing so. So if you think about you know, taking a little, a little bit under a third of your household income and having that if you rent an apartment going toward um, your rent and your utilities or if you own a home towards your mortgage taxes and insurance. So that number is different, of course, for every household because every household has a different income. So when we talk about it in a sense of a bylaw amendment like this, what we're talking about is, is a home affordable to the median household in the geographic area that surrounds Williston? Or is it affordable to a household making some percentage of that median income? Um, so we talk about 100% median, that literally means the middle household's income. And then we might talk about 80% median or, or lower. In, in the case of this, we're talking about 100% and 80%. So, there's a lot to this and there's a lot to unpack. And you know, part of why we're, we're doing this outreach today and the public information session coming up is try to unpack it for folks. So you know, there's a lot of housing discussion going on throughout the state. And Wilson as its um, government and community, we're, we're kind of looking at this of how we, we want to approach it to start, mm -hmm. um, how the select board is going to consider these, these regulation changes. So you know, we, this proposal goes through different project types. So maybe that's a good place to start, kind of how that affects different project sizes here. Right, so um, one of the things about um, including affordable homes in a project is those homes are sold at a price or rented at a price that's below the market rate. Um, they need to be balanced by the, pro the homes in the project that are gonna be sold at market rate. So as project sizes get really small, that gets harder and harder to do. So we have some thresholds in the, the draft bylaw amendment for when affordable homes would be required as part of a project. And um, when we're under five dwellings, we're just calling that a small project. It would, it would be exempt from both the growth management process where um, we've not had a lot of luck gaining the incentivized attributes of projects in those size projects anyway, because they're small. Um, and where including an affordable home would be very challenging. Mm. And then um, requirements from there, we start to require units on projects of sizes between five and nine units um, and going up from there. Um, so if a project is following the affordable inclusionary path, any project over five units is needing to include a unit. And you know, starting off with five to nine include one unit. Mm. Um, so that's that's the inclusionary side. Um, and then there's also the side of somebody who does choose to build a project that's entirely market rate, does not include affordable homes. This bylaw amendment includes an added requirement that they pay a fee mm -hmm. instead of building those homes. And that money would be paid into the town's affordable housing trust fund. Mm -hmm. So you think about inclusionary, it's really talking about including. <laughs> including units that are, are designated for affordability based on these thresholds. That's correct. And we look at, um, I guess if you think about the um, paying into the affordable housing trust fund, there's different fee structures. So it seems this is tiered based on, based on quantity and, and the per home fee based on the size of the project. That's correct. So it looks at it kind of a quantity of scale for, for how much, if someone is not gonna create one of these, some of these units that you have to pay more into the affordable housing trust. That's right, and, and the larger a project gets, the larger that fee gets, not just linear, but um, you know, very large projects where we think there's a lot more opportunity to include affordable homes, you pay more. So we, we have 
um, a 1 to 20 home tier, a 21 to 50, and then everything over 50. Um, the fee goes up. Mm. And, you know, really that is meant very much to encourage especially large projects to be inclusionary rather than be entirely market rate. Mm. So that, that gives us, someone puts a project together, they have to look at the economics of that project and, you know, what, you know, the cost to build and the cost to rent out potentially units, cost to sell units. So they're, they're trying to make the, the math work in That's a lot right. of these cases, it seems like. And if we can uh, put these tools in place to encourage it, then we have these fees that also help if someone decides to um, not move forward with it, they have to pay the fee. We put it into this affordable housing trust. The town has started this. We've seeded it with some money. I think it may be approximately $60,000 or so there. Um, just last night, the town established a housing committee. Um, seven members of the community were appointed by the select board. One of their roles is going to be determining uses for the trust. Um, I know planning staff have had some preliminary discussions about what that may look like. Um, if you could share just some ways these trusts are, are used in, in public policy. Sure. So um, what, one big use of money that's in a trust fund like this would be to help offset the cost of providing affordable homes um, in qualifying projects. Um, what we're talking about in our zoning reforms here is, is projects that might include what we might think of as workforce housing. Mm -hmm. um, these would not be requirements to require to include what we might call deeply affordable housing. Um, you know, homes that might be affordable to somebody making less than half the median income for the area. Those projects are going to come through nonprofit partnerships and things like that, and that's a great place for the town to invest some of its trust fund money to make those projects that just cannot happen with outside funding to help those go. So, number one, just using the money in a trust fund to make um, really affordable projects happen in town. This is like those types of projects too, I've, my experience has been, you, you've got to get these stacks of funding sources That's to right. make it all work. Um, there might be grants out there, there might be some private equity, but it could be the town's way of giving some municipal support to, to get these projects over the top and help make them happen. Yeah, yeah, that would, that would be a, a great way to use that money. Um, there are other more sort of bigger or more challenging things depending on what you want to do, you know, um, actually purchasing a piece of land that could be deeded over to an entity that would build homes on it. Um, another one we've seen is in zoning districts that have rigorous design standards, um, helping a project that needs to come in at an affordable rate meet those more aesthetic standards so it looks more like everything else on the street is a is use of trust fund money. Um, so we've seen that happen in some neighboring communities as well. Yeah, well. Lots of potential, a lot of excitement here as we're, you know, the town is really positioning itself more to take an active role in, in working on housing. We've, we've built more staff capacity with addition of a senior planner um, focused on energy and community development, including housing. So we, and we've got the energy committee and now the housing committee established. So we've got legs of the policy stool established <laughs> as advisory boards to the select board to help work through these, these big questions coming up here. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of work was done by the planning commission to come up with how to formulate this proposal. Mm -hmm. um, other towns have been doing this, some longer than others. Um, you could share kind of what that research and what that, what that process looked like because there's a lot of different ways this could go <laughs> with these variables and how do you where do you find the starting point? Sure. So um, we always start by taking a look at our neighbors and you know we compared our um, possible inclusionary requirements to neighboring communities mostly in Chittenden County. Uh, so we're thinking about what is the proportion of affordable homes that's required in a new project and at what level of affordability do those homes need to be made available? Um, there's some other nuance in there, um, you know, which communities look at um, just a median family income versus a given household size, um, uh, how, do, how are um, perpetual affordability requirements managed, uh, other things like that. But the basic thing is how many affordable homes and how affordable are those homes being required? And, you know, we're lucky to be in a county um, where the city of Burlington's been doing inclusionary zoning for over 25 years, and they've had some research and reporting done on the effectiveness of that program. Um, we have performance to look at in a couple of other communities too, and we're we're slotting right in, um, kind of kind of middle of the pack in terms of those requirements. 
And one of the things that's really challenging about doing something like this is requiring um, private development to include affordable homes makes it harder to build the homes in those developments. It makes it more expensive. And as was you know, reported on in, in Burlington, looking at the performance of their system over those 25 plus years, you can make the requirements so stringent that you reduce the supply of homes in general. Mm. And so you, you, when you're thinking about um, wanting to increase the abundance and affordability of homes, you can require more and more things, but at some point, you just won't see new homes come online at all. So the Planning Commission was very conscious of that. We want a system that is usable for the sector that's gonna produce the homes. Mm. Yeah, it seems it's the benefit of being able to analyze this and mm -hmm. look at the performance measures over time. And it's a starting point, and yeah. it's good we've had that data to look at and kind of see how that plays out from policy to implementation moving ahead, uh, should these bylaws be, be adopted moving up, mm -hmm. moving ahead here. Um, so kind of next steps here, I, I shared at the open that um, you know, there's going to be a public information session coming up on October the 12th on a Thursday evening in, in Town Hall from 6 to 8 p.m. Planning staff will be there. They'll be going over these um, items, taking questions. want to make sure everyone's informed if you want to participate in the public hearing, or you can also come um, share any comments you have ahead of time either. Um, you can email them to myself or, or planning staff to share with the select board. Um, and we're, we're doing the show today. We'll have this posted. We have materials posted online. Um, any of your thoughts on outreach, Matt, ways people can get their questions answered, things uh, um, sure. might be asking? D direct email to myself or uh, senior planner Melinda Scott in our office would work just fine. We're happy to answer questions one at a time as they come in. Um, we do have a lot of resources out there in the Planning Commission and Select Board websites uh, on the nights that they've looked at this. Um, recently, this, this memo um, we prepared to answer some of the frequently asked questions is part of the manager's report of last night's select board yep. meeting, the September 19th meeting. We'll be also producing a set of uh, slides for that October 12th meeting and making those available ahead of time as well. So uh, really would encourage folks, if you haven't, to take a look at the needs assessment document that's out there on the planning department webpage as well, uh, and and the bylaw hearing notice uh, for the October 17th meeting, which includes the the nuts and bolts, the draft bylaw text that would actually make all of these changes happen. Um, but just calling us and talking to us works great too, because um, we can really we can really drill into how this all would work. So shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, that's everything coming up with, with housing right now this fall, but uh, a big effort from the planning department right now is getting ready for the next town plan. And it's uh, kind of looking toward seven years in the future and this work is being called Wilson 2050, th mm -hmm. thinking further out as well. So I wanna share kind of what that process looks like and how people can get in, uh, engaged coming up here. Sure, so um, like all Vermont municipalities that have a comprehensive plan or a town plan, um, Williston has one and it will, the current plan that we're working under will expire toward the end of August of 2025, which means it's time for us to start thinking about how to write the plan that will replace it. Uh, we're, we are calling that effort Williston 2050. Uh, functionally, the new comprehensive plan will guide the focus of the town from 2025 through 2032. So call it Williston 2050, it's a nice round number. Some of the things we do over that eight year time frame, you know, will really start to become evident around 2050. So, you know, it's very forward thinking. Town plans are, are long range in nature. Uh, we start with uh, a vision and then we have a set of goals and objectives and policies that fall out of that vision across a number of state required categories that the plan needs to address. So. Where we're at is we are between now and about Thanksgiving really entering into our really big public engagement push where we're trying to uh, interact with members of the community through a series of both in-person and online events. Um, those are now scheduled and you can, you can reserve your slot at them or sign up to come. Um, the t website for this effort is williston2050.com um, and you can stay in touch with us that way as well. But really between now and the holidays is when we're hoping to put 
the planning commission and the planning staff who will be working together to write this town plan directly in touch with the citizens of the town to make sure that we know everything that's important to people as we as we put that into a document. Mm. That's great. It's, you know, we want to hear from everybody, you know, it's planning for the future of the community. And, you know, this is the vision for Wilson's future. So it's an opportunity for people to get engaged, share your ideas, share your thoughts um, early on here in this, in this process. Yeah, one of the really terrific things about Williston is it really uses its town plan. Um, so I've, I've been working in Williston long enough that there's been a couple different um, versions of the town plan in effect. And you know, we keep that document with the to-do list that comes with it really prominent in our office. And we're, we're looking, you know, every quarter, do, what did this plan say we needed to do and what of it have we accomplished and what's the next step? And that's very rewarding to do. And I want to um, help the planning commission and the community develop that next to-do list for the next eight years so that we can go to work um, making it happen. Um, yeah, we see uh, the adoption of form-based code in Taft Corners. That was a town plan item. It's, and it's been in the plan for a couple iterations, as I recall, and it was you know, something we were able to cross off the list this, this past uh, couple of years here. Yeah, uh, you know, town plans, um, they, they address things that, for communities as diverse as education, transportation, um, housing, design, um, all of those things you just mentioned, and, um, you know, there's things we're working on right now because they were talked about in town plans going back as far as probably 2006 and before. Um, so this is a chance to set those priorities going forward. Great. Well, I think that's all I had for today. Anything else you want to add, Matt, before we wrap up? Uh, I'll just mention the website address again, williston2050.com. Uh, please, please go there to find out everything you can about um, the town plan effort or stop on by our office. We have postcards, business cards, uh, bumper stickers with the Williston 2050 logo on them. And you're gonna see us out in the community as you may have in the last couple months. Um, we love to talk to people about the town plan. It's, it's the kind of thing planners really enjoy working on. Mm, great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us this month on What's Up Williston. Um, I'm your host, town manager, Eric Wells, and I'll, I'll see you around town. Take care.